Hello everyone, today we talk about the origins of Navarre, Aragon and Catalonia just in outline of course um, they are relatively uh, under documented realities of course because we're talking about except for Catalonia that was framed actually within a broader and kind of more politically and socially um, developed system and never underestimate actually within the Western Frankish Kingdom, right? Um, by by name at least, of very wild, primitive, brutal, warlike areas, right? In, in the Pyrenees, that had been contending, in fact, the control of the valleys um, to the Muslims and the Franks too at some point, and thus um, somehow. Um, you know, matured uh, kind of a force of strength that, by I in absolute terms, relatively limited, was still uh, at a local level on a smaller scale, scale very hard. Right, it was very difficult to dislodge these populations and even to subdue them from the Islamic side. And on the longer run, they eroded. In fact, also the Muslim regimes. Uh, of the south and you you can see what I'm talking about even just from the pictures that I'm uploading here you will see these objectively cold um, pretty rugged mountains um, terrifying ground right for anyone to fight but in fact not for for these peoples that had always been that kind of resilient right since ancient times think about in in a broader original scale, the, the Cantabrian Wars, this this difficult north that also in Visigothic times had always posed a problem to the rulers uh, of Toledo, etc. Um, and we will come to appreciate better also this era from a military point of view. Last autumn I made a video about uh, the 11th century uh, heavy infantrymen, exactly, of, of Christian uh, Iberia. So we have depicted a bit the uh, the general background there will come back on it hopefully soon um, so already at that point Leon uh, and uh, its initial uh, you know capacity in uh, controlling Castile was uh, the greatest Christian power um, in, in the Iberian Peninsula Beyond Castile lay the Basque country and the diminutive kingdom of Pamplona, also known of Navarre. And especially the history of this polity is shrouded in obscurity to, to an extreme, right? For, uh, for even for northern Iberian standards. Um, it was already a recognizably independent realm by the second quarter of the ninth century. Politically, it was based upon the old Roman town of Pamplona, and it had essentially emerged from first an Islamic and then a Frankish seigneury over the, the settlement. Under the rule of Sancho Garces, the first during 905 and 25 um, the kingdom had undertaken a relatively modest expansion uh, of its frontiers especially into the fertile region of the Rioja uh, river in fact Sancho Garces belonged to the newly installed Jimenez dynasty and as we have seen, this was a bit the light motive of these powers, seeking from the tribal mountains the control of the fertile valleys, thus establishing a military scenery on the local agricultural population. It was only in the opening decades of the 11th century, however, that the Navarrese kingdom uh, takes its great leap forward. The resources were limited, but the accomplishments were spectacular. Um, 
Sancho Garces III, known to posterity as the Great, uh, thus highlighting uh, his uh, exploit ruling between 1004 and 35, was an all round uh, leader, ruler, commander, uh, who also didn't hesitate without any trace of human mercy to expand its own dominion over the surrounding uh, lands, uh, working also in internationally to present himself fundamentally as a, as a major European ruler, in spite of the limitations uh, of his power, but uh, objectively uh, introducing uh, from the northeast, and Navarre in this sense is the most Frankicized um, of all the um, of all these feudal powers in, in Iberia, as they would become, in fact, as a consequence, um, a bit that kind of knightly culture, that uh, properly feudal system, also the um, old what this entailed in terms of monastic foundations, the Cluniac reforms had just uh, occurred, and as you know, this system was providing two single dynasties that were emerging, after all, from, again, realities that up to um, a few time before had been somehow clanic right uh, to be to be accurate so, so imposing oneself over a community that regarded these leaders as sort of creamy inter pares rather than um, legitimate rulers right by by blood by by uh, by dynasty um, to um, in fact to consolidate this position, he um, was quite militarily active, and to the east, in fact, he annexed the central Pyrenean counties of Sobrarque and Ribagorza, so that, as we will see, will essentially remain in control also of his successors, albeit in a in a split of the original. Uh, dominion that he had uh, coalesced under his his single control in the north he extended his control on the coastal regions of Guipuzkoa and Vizcaya in in the Basque uh, land and even claiming at some point some authority over Vasconia Gascony about which I made a video Right, and you see that that was a sort of uh, buffer state between the Franks. At this point, actually, as we will see, the the Carolingian unity had uh, far gone. Right, so it was mostly Aquitaine at that point, but still, there was a broader Western Frankish interference in, in northern Iberian affair and beyond. That had been, in fact, the gateway through which even part of those Frankish influences had helped these polities uh, coalesce at the expense of the Muslims uh, historically. Sancho was thus a charismatic and accomplished leader that could uh, be formally recognized uh, as by most of the communities he claimed uh, control of as somehow of uh, order bringer who can. Uh, say like that, and the, the nucleus, of course, of the Navarrese Pamplonese kingdom was importantly consolidated by his exploit. The most um, important success, at least in a kind of political, broader international sense, um, was in in Leon, in Castile. In fact, Sancho used cleverly, marriage alliances to de facto unify by name uh, through vassalage or clientelage if you prefer at this point, basically, basically the entire um, Iberian Christendom right? because um, he himself married Mayor Sanchez that was the daughter of the Count Sancho Garces of Castile Names, of course, do not have much fantasy. <laughs> they, they repeat themselves. Sometimes the, the, even the Catalans, they, they use Ramon Berenguer, Berenguer Ramon, these kind of things. 
um, he, um, Sancho married of his sister Urraca to Alfonso V of Leon in 1023. And when his brother-in-law, the Count Garcia Sanchez of Castile, ruling between 1017 and 1029 and precociously dying, uh, assassinated in 1029, um, Sancho exploited, first of all, the frustration of what had been proposed already as the, as it would evolve also in, in later times, the Leonese Castilian alliance and fundamental dynastic sum. And he installed his own son, Fernando, as Count of Castile, betrothing him, by the way, to Sancha, that was the sister of Bermudo III of Leon in 1032. In other words, he accomplished what, in fact, the, the Leonese and the Castilian rulers per se had not been able to, right, given that here there was, in fact, the lack of a Castilian heir and securing a dynastic foothold in the Leonese ruling house, also establishing a protectorate over the kingdom of Leon entirely at some point by uh, essentially mean of this diplomatic coup because he didn't have actually the, the military capacity to subjugate the two countries. But um, the local nobility fundamentally granted him such uh, possibility because um, it would essentially divert pressure uh, from, from them. At least uh, they would enjoy kind of a more decentralized position towards their overlord. Thus, towards the end of his reign, Sancho could claim the control namely of an area stretching from Zamora in the southwest up to Gascony, right on the Gulf of Biscay, up to Barcelona to um, that he essentially managed to, to, be, um, to be recognized as a sort of hegemon in. Uh, that's the reason why Sancho proudly styled himself as emperor literally Imperator, and King of the Spains, Rex Hispaniarum. This concept is radically important in the entire um, Iberian history, especially during the Reconquista, as these rulers were seeking essentially a true imperial um, legitimacy over the peninsula. As such, this is um, often overlooked, right? Even if you look, there are a few countries that actually claim this. Not even, not even France. It was kind of the most imperial de facto powers um, um, in Europe, and and even in Germany, where yes, the imperial title would be secured in a, but more in a universal than a properly a German sense, kingdoms wise. When you look at Iberia, when you look at Britain too, you'll notice that there is properly an imperial awareness. The Anglo-Saxons had in mind that they had just they were elected to rule over all the other peoples that inhabited the British Isles. Right? The Iberian Peninsula was a bit different because there was um, kind of a a greater struggle against also an infidel force, um, not simple paganism per se, um, and especially a more advanced one because Central Southern Spain in spite of the political crisis of the, the caliphate and eventually the, the typhus, was by far more advanced, richer, more populated, right? And it originally had um, owned, like in Visigothic times, um, um, sort of universal grandeur, especially incarnated by the councils of Toledo. That at this point, the Iberian Christian policies had had to abandon because uh, in exchange for uh, what was becoming de facto already a crusading support from the papacy they had had to adopt the Roman and not the the Visigothic right uh, anymore 
but this sense that the the Barian Plateau was a, like just huge land where also different fates coexisted, and that in fact, especially the the Leonese Castilian rulers would style themselves after the capture of Toledo as properly protectors of the Christians, of the Muslims, of the Jews, all together, right? Because the latter two represented an enormous population, also in the Christian held territory at that point, um, is is deeply imbued, right? It's not even, uh, there, there ain't much of probably even Visigothic legacy, and you, know, you would think that and these powers of the North were connected to that. This is a mistake, first of all, because Alpine, yes, there were refugees, think about Pelagio, the stories, and so on, and a, and a certain mythology that was somehow so nationalistic developed in modern times uh, the north had notoriously been uh, you know idiosyncratically to say the least opposed to any Visigothic event right they there were Visigothic military colonies in the north whatever but those were essentially um, uh, part of an occupation regime of peoples that since ever were quite different from all the rest of the peninsula it is already quite diverse in itself and it was rather the Christian struggle properly the nature of an imperium that consisted traditionally in this cosmic clash between the, in this case, the Muslims and the Christians, even though we know also perfectly well that, again, it was a matter of prevailing over the other, not eliminating each other, also because they needed each other to rule for almost for the entire Middle Ages, and thus um, we have seen those imperial titles protecting the entire the entire wall, as it was considered, as definitely the Barren Peninsula was a universe on its own. So, in Sancho's title, you can perceive this enormous accomplishment that, that, of course, was felt to have been won with arms, but also with this greater wisdom that, politically, diplomatically, had brought him to acquire an hegemony, uh, even if only formally. Uh, to most of the extent of his dominion over such an impressive amount of communities mm -hmm. uh, and regarding to the in fact much vaunted uh, Im imperial nature of this dominion I must say that it crumbled almost uh, as soon as it came into being right Pamplona alone hardly had any kind of resource even receiving tribes from, from these other lands to to impose uh, an Iberian scale regime, right? Um, the same Navarre's claims to authority over Leon and Gascony evaporated within months uh, after Sancho's death, right? Uh, in 1035. While the remaining territories, so the ones that the Pamplonese had somewhat more directly controlled, were partitioned among. Sancho's sons. In according to his testament, um, and as it was practice of the time, more or less giving equal right, um, partitions to the various male heirs. So Garcia, the eldest, received Navarre, right, so the, the ancestral lands. Fernando, as we've seen, had been installed in Castille, so that's where he actually remained. Ramiro Aragon, that we will see now, uh, and Gonzalo, the uh, newly acquired, uh, directly acquired Sobrarbe and Ribagorza areas, as we've seen. So this opens to the history of Aragon itself. Um, this was a Pyrenean county, about which, just as for Navarre, we know a very few. We know, also in this case, that the polity emerges um, as a territorial domination recognizable as such in the early 9th century. Mm -hmm. And we know that it had successfully resisted so far attempts by both uh, the Muslims and the Franks to impose a lordship over the, the county. And from this base they would hopefully expand um, as lords over other counties um, and other duchies because these existed as well. We know that under the Aragonese Count Galindo Aznar, 
were ruled essentially around the, the mid 9th century the land came under the orbit however of the monarchs of Navarre as we have previously seen also in the uh, inheritance of Sancho of, of Pamplona such influence in fact would persist until until the death of the uh, the same Sancho Garces the, the third um, at his death in 1035 we see what is considered factually the first Aragonese monarch as such by this distinguished from um, the Pamplonese um, scenery albeit he was literally the son of of the of the Navarrese ruler Ramiro the first who ruled up to 1063 and this power was less fortunate than his father's because uh, of course as we said most of the success of his policies was connected with their military power so Ramiro uh, took that direction as well in 1045 he took advantage of the assassination of his half brother Gonzalo extending his lordship over the territories of Sobrarpe and Ribagorza, territories that, as we've seen, had been newly conquered by his father in Bu's footsteps, thus Ramiro could walk by uh, even aiming at the, um, the, the control of Navarre. But any uh, subsequent effort to push westwards into the Pamplonese territory, as much as uh, in the south, the words the, the Islamic one, sp the specifically the one of the Taifa of Zaragoza, met with uh, very limited success. In fact, uh, if one looks at Aragonese power uh, under Ramiro, you realize that um, the country hardly did anything but remaining compact within its boundaries that were essentially also mountain ones right and thus sheltered by nature and with great difficulty only managing to to even try to, to expand forward Ramiro tried to um, leave in this sense the uh, the highlands capturing Grouts that is in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, this happened in 1063, but he was defeated and killed in battle on that occasion by the uh, joint forces of the Taifa king Al Muqtadir of Zaragoza and his Castilian allies, by the way. So the ones actually of the same, um, the same. Navarrese dynasty as we've seen proving also how this northeastern Iberian reality was to be kept at bay um, for for other reasons than just uh, the modest uh, expansionism it could accomplish but mostly also the relations between the Taifas and the same uh, the more important Christian kingdoms here essentially you have Castilla and uh, Zaragoza aligned to prevent the rise of some Aragonese um, ambitious ruler um, that in fact wouldn't accomplish much even in the following decades because Ramirez's son and successor Sancho Ramirez the first ruling from 1063 to 1094 would continue the aggressive policy of expansion of Aragon towards uh, the neighbors but it wouldn't be before 20 years that the fertile plain of Huesca was subdued by the Aragonese senior. Then we can look at Catalonia that as we were saying before has kind of a kind of a, um, broader profile here. So you know what we're talking about the um, the Spanish mark um, that had been created by the Franks essentially as a protectorate on this um, far eastern end of the Pyrenees mm -hmm. uh, that already uh, 
hosted a cluster of small and quite independent-minded Christian principalities since Visigothic times. Of course, the area had been um, brought, in fact, uh, under Frankish um, rule, under Islamic um, um, lordship again, but it always maintained, because of the obvious decentralization for both centers of power, literally in between, a great autonomy. And the Ebro Valley and all the, the in fact, the Mediterranean um, watershed, not just of the northern, of northern Iberia, but also talking about the, the southwest of France, um, had uh, historically been significantly urbanized, quite um, maritimely well put, let's say, and uh, developed, in fact, important connections with uh, with Provence, with Liguria, with Tuscany, uh, etc., and importantly separated from the uh, the rest of the Iberian Peninsula linguistically, culturally, uh, etc. Uh, a great part of the local identity was Visigothic in nature, more than even the, the say the central um, Spain, the other northern Iberian. Uh, politics as we've seen and the beginnings of Catalonia per se right, um, is to be traced to the Spanish mark actually, where you can see a lot overlapping of course from the previous um, from the previous times but we're talking about essentially the early 9th century with, with Charlemagne's expeditions and the um, the broader network of relations that had been formed in this frontier area also within the Pyrenees we've seen it in the video about Gascony and with this um, remembering this other kind of Frankish overlordship very often nominal and definitely very decentralized in, uh, in places like Navarre, Aragon etc. Um, these powers had even countered the, the Franks at some point, the famous route of, of Roncesvalles was uh, there were Muslims in it, but mostly there were Basques trying to, to keep essentially the Franks out, at least to, to, the, to the degree that wouldn't make them interfere uh, with, their, with their autonomy and just kind of instead um, giving their support if there was some kind of Islamic uh, wave to, to, to stem um, and this area, differently from the mountainous one, is actually, well, of course there were some mountainous parts of this all, because basically the Muslims had conquered mostly all the, all the or at least controlled uh, more easily the, the lowlands, right? So I it's as if there was a chain, you see it even from the, the political maps that I inserted here that overlaps with, with the Pyrenees, where most of these Christian forces had withdrawn, carrying out guerrilla, launching these raids, and that this had always been basically the problem of, of, of any Hispanic ruler, right, taming the north, because you couldn't quite successfully wage an expedition up to the mountains. There was less there, but if the locals were warlike enough, they, they could always harass you in some way. And it's in this context that such powers are forged. Mm -hmm. So, as long as the Carolingian Empire had held um, the area of Catalonia had fundamentally remained under uh, Fran the Frankish orbit, within the Frankish orbit, you know that the Carolingians proper and in the latter half um, of the same 9th century. Um, however, the Western Frankish influence, and we saw it in that video I made on um, southwestern Francia in the 10th century, the, um, the newly established Catalan counties were very often even more connected with Paris than, say, the Aquitanians, the Auvergnians, because exactly in virtue of their decentralization, they saw it uh, more advantageous to 
see some sort of cooperation coordination with the royal dynasty as opposed to other powers that were more concerning instead of a Frankish proper expansionism from north north of the Loire. Um, the Catalan counties um, had been properly established by the Franks, but uh, they had been soon left increasingly to their own uh, devices. And the areas were more urbanized, more literate, um, more commercially dynamic, essentially, than any other power we've seen here that was essentially kind of mountain-based. Like, th these were cattle breeders and pretty much it, right? The hardcore kind of mountaineering uh, world likeness. Um, Catalonia was more advanced, right? And at the collapse of Carolingian presence, the power vacuum had been filled by a number of local magnates, sometimes, in fact, also more, um, say, less feudal origin than than elsewhere, that, and that, in fact, considered themselves properly as independent rulers, because, yes, they basically occupied the offices of, of public power, but these were considered such, not much because of Carolingian investment, but because there was an actually public power dating back to Roman times um, that had survived in the area and that had just made that system work, right? You see that, again, compared... Because th this Catalan um, counties were very close to also the, uh, the rest of Occitania, right? And a great part of South western Gaul, um, but were also the most documentarily productive, right? And the, in a sense we have less as far as the bigger foundations really are, because this were, because the wealth was more heavily, heavily distributed, so we mostly look at at a civil administration rather than the, the big kind of, I don't know, monasteries you can find in Auvergne and other places like that where it's the either lay or that case specifically ecclesiastic power that had a, a sound core. Um, and so th there were all these various countlets. The most powerful of whom, uh, between 870 and 897, that was Wifred the Hairy. Mind even the names here, because they're somehow more, not just Catalan, but sometimes even more Germanic than, say, Basque ones and or other uh, Spanish ones, if you want, by Wifred the Hairy. It was the Count of Barcelona. So you immediately realize that the most important center here on the coast, and so kind of more central than the compared to the um, to this other also mountainous realities that existed, was active was not actually weakened in all this um, in this phase not even during the 10th century where as you know there was a lot of movement around including the Saracens and so as we'll see now also a reactivation of Islamic lordship uh, in the area right um, that was an area was very important ideologically to reach even by the armies of the Cordoban rulers such as Almanzor and al Muzaffar. Why? Because, um, first of all, it was a way to contain power to what was still seen as the broader Frankish Empire, right? Because it doesn't matter that, again, during the 10th century you have a, a, a disgregation um, that is also mostly evident in the Western Frankish Kingdom, so that you don't really um, you don't really see even expeditions in the south anymore because everything gets entrenched in the, at a local level. So it was very important ideologically for the last successful rulers of uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba, about which I made a video incidentally also a couple of months ago, to reassert control on what was in fact the Spanish mark, right? The one created as a, as a, as a foothold of Carolingian and thus universal power, Christian universal power, 
um, in, in Spain it was instead considered ideologically not just by the northerners that were in this sense copying essentially what the Muslims were doing but in fact by the caliphs that as you know had resumed this title in, in the west um, over the one of Emirate of Cordoba exactly to stress um, a universal dimension at that point of regional scale so over the entire Iberian Peninsula and also the rest of the north as you know was brought under by um, by the Muslims at some point, even the the sanctuary of, of uh, Santiago in Compostela was was reached by Almanzor, who, by the way, didn't devastate it, uh, despite that was kind of a, a raiding campaign, because that's just how you, bro you could bring down the northerners um, by, by the Terrans, because he wanted, in fact, to win them over, to present himself as, like, uh, an alternative in the world as you know, backs and forth in this regard in pretty dire times, uh, also from, from a Christian perspective, because the caliphate seemed at, um, at some point to have been resumed su successfully in this regional uh, hegemony. Following the death of al-Muzaffar, however, in 1008, the Count of Barcelona, Ramon Borrell I, ruling between 992 and 1017, and his brother, Armengol I, Count of Urgell, not important Catalan county, ruling between also 992 and 1010, were involved in the chaos that followed, in fact, to the, poli to the political crisis of Al-Andalus, Essentially, um, the same Cordoba was even occupied by mercenary troops. That was the moment in which the same cali the, say, the, the same caliphal successors decided not to resume the caliphal title anymore. It's as if there had been probably a a, 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 a mental trauma followed up uh, the, the followed to the loss of Cordoba. That up to that point, historically, had managed to control um, the Al-Andalus. And from there, basically the entire um, Spain in this hegemonic claims. Um, so much the Muslims cared about that traditional kind of imperium holding that um, had not to be obscured by even a, a minimal defeat, right? And, and this aspect is, is fascinating. Um, eventually, uh, Muhammad al-Mahdi recovered Cordoba from Berber control. What do the Catalans do exactly in this period? Well, they actually support the would-be caliph Muhammad al-Mahdi to recover Cordoba from the Berber soldiery. Right, so, again, uh, Ramon Borel and Armengol literally lead an army to Al-Andalus to support essentially the claims of what seemed to be at least the uh, most suitable pretender to the caliphal succession. Why did they do this? Well, obviously because they were within still the caliphal universal order and they hoped to preserve it as much as it could provide stability and enough autonomy from their side. Um, by the way, the Catalans that in that 1008 that came to be the year of the, the Catalans, in fact, uh, showed off so much uh, in An Al Andalus, bringing their troops there, um, wouldn't actually uh, campaign against the Muslim South so frequently. Or, or such in such grand fashion um, after this. There were further Catalan raids into Al Andalus ten years later in ten eighteen, also in ten twenty four. But they weren't part of a broader pattern of territorial conquest um, and even the same northern frontier with Muslim Spain was scarcely altered 
by these movements. Instead, in the first half of the 11th century, the Catalans and the Muslims strengthened their political and economic ties. Right? It was very important for those Catalan counties to have a direct um, and um, uninterfered with trade uh, with, with the South, with the, the important uh, commercial activity that um, took place all along the eastern Iberian coast, the Mediterranean coast, uh, most of which was controlled by the Muslims together with the interland resources, right? So these Catalan aristocracies that were growing in, um, in power were always more in need, for, uh, first of all, for example, luxury products from the south. And uh, they were doing so autonomously, because as we have seen, Catalonia didn't quite have uh, a unitary government, per se. And so even if somebody had backed, let's say, one type of foreign policy as opposed to the other, uh, the, the, there was always the other faction countering it. Thus, the stagnation on the uh, Christian-Muslim frontier was actually paralleled by a quite intense competition, struggle, and conflict between the various Catalan magnates. Right? Count Berenguer Ramon I, ruling between 1017 and 1035, wasn't able to maintain his authority over his increasingly rebellious Catalan magnates. By the way, I forgot to mention that I made a video uh, comparison between Catalonia and Lombardy. Actually, between, if, if I'm not wrong, the 8th and the 10th century or the 11th century. So we are basically in the same time. So I want to get a um, bit more of pattern there and seeing how uh, especially the, the Catalan counties were somehow autonomistically oriented and um, lacking thus a kind of a, a sovereign state that could impose them. Uh, in fact, a, a unitary direction, you can check that video out. Um, I made a video about the crown of Aragon as well, if you're interested, but we will have to talk more about the, um, in fact, Catalonia altogether and the county of Barcelona especially because I realized we haven't quite um, focused more narrowly on, on that topic. During the second quarter of the 11th century, there was a, a gradual breakdown in public order. Right, um, Comital power was attacked head-on by the great nobles. There were private armies. Um, we've seen it also in that video we recently made about the Reconquista military vocabulary, um, organization, um, etc. Um, so there were actually a lot of, um, of course, of private military clientels, as much as essentially illegal castles that were built all across the country at the hands of this new aristocracy that was made up mostly of petty castellans because at the end of the day these counties gravitated around a fortress of some sort but backed in the sense also by an important control of towns uh, and the aforementioned trade that really escaped an overlordship. This again had happened because basically uh, the Spanish mark had actually even started well as far as uh, um, a general appointee was concerned was a method of silis against the, the Muslims at the time so the Catalans had managed to preserve their own autonomy altogether but now that caliphate power as we see Islamic power was was decreasing the caliphate had dissolved um, in the Thaifas um, there was no need to stick together that way it was better to start creating a power from again, your private means, and especially in a land where you lack, differently from the aforementioned examples of Navarre and Aragon, actually a central, this is an important difference, that um, powers also like Leon, Castilla, etc., emerged from probably a dynastic power, and instead that kind of more confederal character that even the crown of Aragon, that basically will 
will have that center. In fact, we'll install a dynasty, but still essentially floating over um, uh, a sum of communities that would elect such ruler and very differently from like, the, the feudal uh, continental powers of Spain, the most also could, would become the most powerful as a matter of fact, um, was quite, quite different. And it, it was born like this, right? Because at the end of the day, Catalonia was not like a big, like you can say, a kingdom, right? Like the one that was being formed eventually by the Union of Castile or, or Aragon. There is no comparison also with the, with the kingdoms of uh, the post carolingian kingdoms, even the ones in which actually the, the monarchy evaporated. There was, there was yet more structure. This was essentially a big, it was a province, right? It's too, too small to call it a region per se, because also most of what would become that side of, of Spain, in, in fact, with the crown of Aragon and the sum of various powers we've seen, the kingdom of Valencia, etc., as, um, was still in the hands of the Muslims. Right, consider this, we're talking about limited territories. And this, of course, wouldn't provide with the, with the country altogether with enough means of centralization just to impose a rule. That paradoxically would stem more from the, from the feudal side of the story that we think, ah, it's all decentralized. No, very often it's a much greater gluing force than this, this other one. Um, and not, not that they wouldn't have success, but to, through the sum of multiple powers, not just per se. Um, there was, however, of course, an attempt to restore order in a public sense carried out by the Count Ramon Berenguer I, ruling between 1035 and 1076, who was very methodic ruler, he skillfully employed the same divisions that, in fact, uh, Catalonia provided with, especially the ones of his opponents, as you understand. He used large sums of money uh, that he started collecting. Um, we have seen it in the video about the Paris system, right, as a tribute from the Taifa clients, right? Uh, plus, you know, the considerable amount of wealth that would come from Barcelona to this major uh, port uh, in the province and um, thus gradually recompacting a bit uh, the ranks uh, in this way. First of all by uh, taking control of the enemy castles, right, so starting properly to regain the fortresses, the territorial domination, and binding his subordinates with personal ties of fidelity. So in other words, creating, of course, a parallel private net of power that had hardly anything to do with, with the public one, and thus kind of feudalizing a bit the system that, as we've seen, had not been yet. And consider that this was happening uh, in, in a land that was importantly exposed also to Frankish culture, politically, military-wise, so yes, the Catalonia does maintain that kind of uh, almost stereotypically um, kind of confederal profile but there is a lot of, of, of chivalry there is a lot of sense of again a private also dynastic power by, by a degree that just has to be recompacted because in terms of wealth distribution the land is very different from from the other ones um, in, uh, in Christian in Christian Iberia and thus it has to follow kind of other rhythms, dynamics, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and you'll realize that, in fact, even the local towns, cities, wouldn't develop quite like a, on the longer run, properly a communal profile. I mean, there would be, of course, such communal autonomies, etc. But um, this, this is a bit like the county of Toulouse that in fact is very similar. It's much more feudal in nature because the local count is really a major lord also in a more kind of, even though they're Occitanians, but in a more French kind of direction that cooperates with a local commune, de facto. And that is also limited by this because it's a city government. So hardly at this in this uh, kind of 
cats, uh, even in Barian and, and Gallic sense, in a, an actual territorial domination all around. Um, but that has, uh, that for this reason, sees at the end of the day the prevalence of the, of the dynast as such, right? So it's always the great nobleman of some sort of feudal investment that rules over even very large and autonomous centers. Mm -hmm. um, so that the communal power there is eroded or shared or hybridized in that regard and Catalonia does develop his own sheer kind of feudal epos and uh, knightly uh, codes and, and so on, right? So we will see it at, at some other point it's really really interesting um, and and as you understand was an important communication also with the western lands uh, with Aragon we've seen too um, we will see all this in another video we'll keep talking about the Barian history warfare etc for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.